Hello. Hang on a second. I have this candle thing. I got it a while ago. Oh, God. Ah. <laughs> yeah. It's very pretty. And when the heat is on it, it spins around. Um, but the candle that I, the only candle I had that fit burned down, so I haven't been using it. And consequentially, I've been losing the little kitties on it. There's supposed to be like five. I only have two. <laughs> that is not the point of the stream. I'm just saying to get to know you guys. And me, guess what? I have a little candle thingy that has tiny little cats on it. And I have broken it so many times and I keep losing the pieces. Don't give me tiny things with little holes where things fall off easily and get lost because I will lose them. And then I'll put them in my mouth sometimes for some reason on camera. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rachel. <laughs> Welcome to my book club. <laughs> This is a vampire book club. It is titled, Vampires Are My Special Interest Book Club. That is how I start every stream typically, and I have yet to find out a way to say that um, naturally. Can you see it over? You can't, can you? How much of me do you need? Like a little cat, it's way more important. <laughs> I don't think you can. No, whatever, it's for me. It's for me and just me, I guess. Um, <laughs> we typically read vampire anthologies on this channel um i say that knowing that there's a lot of time where i in between books i just um pick whatever i want <laughs> sorry i just i was just hearing myself and going wow i am being insane probably because i usually make the studio thingy oh Yes, Chucky shirt. Hi, bestie. Um, I usually lower the YouTube thingy so I can't see myself. I think that was throwing me off and making me more <laughs> nervous. <laughs> right. We're reading a vampire anthology today. We are about halfway through, and it's called Vampires. Very succinct to the point. You know what you're getting. Vampires. Uh, generally, I just got it in like the horror section. But I believe this is more of a uh, young adult, early 20s demographic. So if you're hoping for something really bloody and gory, I don't think you're going to get it in this book. But again, we are about halfway. Um, on the Magic Stealer by Josephia Sherman. Let's read our book in our book club. At some point earlier today, I was like, I need to get ready for this stream. And somewhere in that, I just took the bookmark out of the book and put it over here. How is that preparing for the stream where I'm going to read? The bookmark's over there. Whatever. <laughs> the Magic Stealer by Joseph uh, Sherman. Another thing that's throwing me off is the timing. The whole, like, um... Daylight savings thing? I am not used to doing this at 6 o'clock when the sun's still out. It's going to be weird to get used to. <laughs> it's more of a spooky vibe, typically. Okay. Nitika. 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 Staggered to a stop, all at once, painfully aware of wariness and cold. Shivering, she glanced around, one slim, black-haired girl of sixteen years. The forest was a lonely place in the fading orange light of afternoon, barren with the coming of winter. Empty branch branches creaked and scraped together in the chill gusts of wind, and the air was sharp with the promise of snow. A new bout of shivering tore through her. N Nidica, Nidica, Nidica. Yeah, oh my god. I can't look at you while I'm trying to do this, Bessie, because I'm just going to go on a ramble about fucking daylight savings time. Like, next thing I knew, it was like four in the morning, and I was like, how the hell did that happen? Which, I understand, that means in my brain it was three o'clock, and why was I awake at three o'clock? Fair enough to say, but I shouldn't have been awake at four. Three happens sometimes. Four is insane. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> 
<laughs> Empty branches creaked and scraped together in the chill gusts of wind, and the air was sharp with the promise of snow. A new bout of shivering tore through her. Nitika, 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 Nitika. Clutched the folds of her deerskin robe more tightly about herself, wishing it were fur. Skania had never needed fur, whispered her mind, not she who could warm herself with a simple flash of will. Skania, who was dead. Suddenly the forest seemed to blur. I will not weep, the girl told herself fiercely, wiping a hand roughly across her eyes. The necklaces she wore chinked together softly, and Nitika winced in new pain. These were a uh, power speaker's necklaces full of magic, charms of bone and shell and wood. Skania's necklaces left to Nitika, her apprentice in power. Apprentice, no more than that. A true power speaker, a magician healer like Skania could calm the winter wind or walk through a blizzard and not feel the slightest cold. Nitika had managed to ward off the chill for a time, but as always, the force of her will had faded and the power with it. You were wrong, she whispered to Skania's spirit. I'm no power speaker. I never will be. But what else was there for her? Though none of the people had ever been anything but kind to her, Nitika, orphaned almost from birth, with only one distant clan uh, relations to care for her, had had no real place in any of the lodges. But old Skania, then power speaker for the tribe, had quickly taken the frightened child under her wing as apprentice. Nitika smiled fleetingly, remembering those early days. At first it had been wonderful, learning the smallest bits of power and dreaming of the day when she too could walk with spirits and work true magic. But then, when she was nearly ten, the trouble had come, and the form of Gungosha, Gung Gungosa, 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 a man of the people just returned from long journeyings, proud, ambitious, Gungosa, who also claimed power for himself. He and Skania had quarreled bitterly. To the old woman's disgust, the people had favored Gungosa. He was young and handsome, while Skania was rough of tongue and face. Besides, what tribe needed two power speakers? Skania had gone off, had gone storming off into the wilderness to live. And, though it had hurt to leave home and playmates, N Nitika had gone with her. Nitika sighed, her breath a plume on the frosty air. Do you ever just, like, have a feeling that if the author of the thing you're reading heard how you were pronouncing the words in their story, they would just, like, hate you? <laughs> Nitika sighed, her breath a plume on the frosty air. It had been lonely sometimes, with just the two of them, and sometimes the funny or dangerous little spirits of their wood. Skania had promised her that once she, her apprenticeship was done, they would return to the people. But that apprenticeship could never end now, for in the midst of Nitika's final test of power, Skania's heart had given out. Her dying words lingered in the girl's mind. Take my necklaces. You are a power speaker in all but name. You are. Believe. Nitika hid her face in her hands. How can I believe? She asked Skania's spirit silently. Without my final testing, no spell will work for me. If she stayed out here without shelter, she'd freeze. She would return to the lodges of the people. There was nowhere else. Head down, Nitika st uh, started warily forward. Just then, a male voice asked doubtfully, Nitika? She looked up with a gasp. A young man in a hunter's tunic and leggings. A boy. Really, a boy really, perhaps a little older than herself. Mercha versus Mircha. It took me so long to, that's a different character in a completely different story. I got distracted by chat. Hey, stop talking to me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, a boy really, perhaps a little older than herself, stood before her, a bow slung over his shoulder, staring at her as though she was the most wonderful thing he had ever seen. He was tall and slender, with the high cheekbones and dark reddish skin of the people, and, thought Nitika, he was handsome too, even if his nose was just a tiny bit crooked. A sudden, warm memory flashed into her mind of a little boy with a slightly crooked nose and bright, laughing eyes. To Hanya, her dearest childhood friend. They had played together so happily in the long-ago days, before Skania had taken her away from the people. 
to Hanya, but you've grown so, so, her tongue stumbled over the word handsome, so tall, and you've grown so pretty. Ooh, <laughs> that's called Riz. <laughs> Tahanya burst out, then dropped his gaze in embarrassment, dark skin reddening. I, uh, I mean, I thought you were living with Skania, power speaker. I was, Nitika touched the power necklaces about her neck. Tahanya's eyes widened. He dipped his head in respect, power speaker. No, I'm not. Nitika wanted to protest, but somehow, seeing the wonder of Tahanya's face, she couldn't say the words. When she kept silent, Tahanya continued in a hushed voice. Maybe you can help us with that. That? Nitika echoed, bewildered. Tahanya glanced about at the darkening forest, and Nitika thought she saw a flicker of fear in his dark eyes. Fear? Tahanya had never been afraid of anything. This isn't a good time or place to talk, he said shortly. Come, let's get back to the lodges before they shut us out. Riz. <laughs> He wouldn't say another word. Nitika, forcing her weary body on, had to struggle to keep up with his longer stride. The lodges of the people were suddenly ahead of them, set in a wide clearing and surrounded by a protective palisade, palisade? palisade of wooden stakes. That wall wasn't there before, Nitika said. To Hanya, what's going on? He shook his head. Hurry, they're closing the gates. But Nitika hesitated a moment. Like, I feel like I should be saying Nitika or... N Nitika, not Nitika, but I, this is what I've chose and I have to stick with it. <laughs> but Nitika hesitated a moment. What about Gung, Gung Osha? Oh God, Gung Osha, she asked nervously. Will he let me, he isn't here, Tahanya cut in. Come on, Eha, Setna, he shouted, wait for us. They dove inside just as the gates were being pulled shut. Nitika all at once found herself amid too many lodges, too many people, too many curious faces. Surely things had never been so, so crowded when she was a child, and surely there hadn't been such fear on so many faces. Everyone seemed to be moving closer, surrounding her, eyes wary, and Nitika fought down the urge to turn and run. Tahanya hurried to introduce her. Don't you recognize her? This is Nitika. Nobody looked relieved. How can you be so sure? Somebody muttered. I cannot type it. Uh, I mean, I could type it. I just moved my keyboard so it'd be out of the way. So it's a pain in the ass. Um, how do I spell it? N-I-T-I-K-A. Tahanya hurried to introduce her. Don't you recognize her? This is Nitika. Nobody looked relieved. How can you be so sure? Somebody muttered. It is Nitika. Tahanya protested. Look, she... It's been a long time, a woman shouted out of the crowd. Fat-faced Sila, Nitika realized with a shock of recognition. Sila, who'd always saved a bit of sweet gum for her when she was a child. Sila, who was now adding sourly. How do we know what that little girl grew up to be? Um... I'm amazed at the fact that she hasn't seen this person in a very long time, and her first thought is, fat-faced Sila. <laughs> okay, that's a choice. That is a choice. I can't, I can't throw you in jail for your thought crimes, but I am judging you slightly. <laughs> this might be anyone, a man added sharply. Nitika recognized lean-faced Dakenta, Dakenta, the hunter, Dakenta, whose shattered leg, Skinia, had healed so well he had not the slightest limp but he obviously didn't recognize her because he continued maybe someone not even human suddenly all the crowding all the fear was too much for nitika oh what nonsense she shouted at the top of her lungs and the crowd fell silent i am nitika and i have returned if i was some sort of monster do you think i would be out when the sun was still shining well do you? And if I was a creature of evil, how could I possibly be wearing these? She held up the power necklaces so all could see. The crowd buzzed in awe. Power speaker, the old one must be dead. The young ones come back. Come to save us. Save you? Nitika glanced helplessly at Tahanya. Save you from what? But Tahanya was moving respectfully aside to make room for a tall, powerfully built... Oh, what's the official pronunciation? Mm, heavy N. 
Nu kan jag. Nu tycker jag. Nu tycker jag. Nu tycker jag. What do you mean, heavy end? <laughs> I am. Oh, cool. Good enough then. Nu tycker jag. Sounds kind of Russian. Oh, well, I have no idea how to do a Russian accent. I could not. That is one of the ones I cannot do. So <laughs> thank you for your help. It's not helping me because I'm dumb, but <laughs> whatever. Who cares? We're in the middle of a story. <laughs> but Tahenya was moving respectfully aside to make room for a tall, power powerfully built man of middle years. His deerskin robe richly embroidered in porcupine qu uh, quills and beads of shell and gleaming gold glittered in the last rays of the setting sun. That was Okenhaya, chief of the people, imposing as ever, though a little more gray-threaded his thick braids than Nikita remembered. Power speaker, Okenhaya gave a formal dip of his head, equal, almost to equal, and all at once Nikita was too scared to argue. Nidika, I did that, my bad. Nidika was too scared to argue. Come, the chief said, we must talk. Nidika had been in the chief's lodge only once with Skania. Then it had seemed a huge, frightening place. Now it was somehow smaller, less imposing. A wicker and bark home like any other, smelling cleanly of pine and cooking herbs. Nidika started without thinking for the woman's side of the lodge, then remembered just in time that a power speaker was above such rules. She sat instead at Okanhaya's feet as Skania had done, hoping she didn't look as nervous as she felt. The chief wasted no time. I imagine old Skania is dead? A pity. She was a truly wise woman, and you are her replacement, I see, young though you are. Nidika struggled to match his brisk tone. I was in Skania's, uh training all my life you know that there that wasn't a lie she wasn't actually claiming to be what she wasn't and why do you need a replacement she asked daringly what about gangosa that liar okanhaya straightened angrily oh i suppose he did have some small power but nothing as strong as skania's magic may her spirit forgive us we made a mistake choosing him and he knew it he went out into the forest one night swearing he would conjure up true magic so we'd all respect him, but he never came back. He ran away? Who knows? Okanhaya hesitated, and Nidika saw the fierceness fade from his eyes, leaving him all at once looking old and worn. The trouble began soon after that. A hunter disappeared. Targa, you probably don't remember him. We found his body in the morning, bloodless and torn as though wild beasts had been at it. The chief let out his breath in a wary sigh, and Nidika asked warily, why don't you think animals killed him? Because the same thing has happened again and again. A hunter or a woman gathering fruit or even a child straying off from the others. Anyone who dares linger alone after sundown. One by one, they disappear. One by one, their bodies are found in the morning. Empty. We have found our vampire. Okanhaya, I, that was my commentary, by the way. He didn't say vampire. <laughs> Okanhaya stared pleadingly at Nidika, power speaker. I have gone out there myself. I have tried to hunt down this killer by night, and I have failed. But you can help us. You must. No, shrilled a terrified part of Nidika's mind. Maybe Skania could have helped you, but I'm not Skania. But to Nidika's shock, she heard herself saying in an almost steady voice, I will do what I can. Nia, Nitika. Nitika. That makes sense. But I don't want to change it in the middle of a story. <laughs> I don't want to confuse anybody. It's okay if you're distracting me because I know you're helping. I love you, bestie. <laughs> um, need to, okay, so if you're ever reading the story yourself, say it, Nitika. Don't, don't follow in my footsteps. Don't, don't do what I do. Do as I say, not as I do. And then not even what I say. <laughs> don't do that either. <laughs> Okanhaya nodded. I can ask no more. He got to his feet and Nidika scrambled to hers, wondering with a wildly pounding heart if he was going to ask her to go out into the forest right now. But the chief said gently, you traveled a far way today, haven't you? I can see the wariness on your face. Rest tonight and have no fear. I shall command that all the people stay safe at home till morning. Nidika bowed. Thank you.
As for where you'll stay, mm, I think Tahanya's family has room within their lodge. The chief's eyes were suddenly bright and teasing, and I'm sure Tahanya wouldn't mind at all. Uh, n- no, I guess not. To her horror, Nitika could feel herself starting to blush. Stop that, she told herself fiercely, but no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't forget how handsome Tahanya had looked there in the forest, and he had called her pretty. For a moment, Nitika found herself wishing she had never been touched by power, that she had not been left alone to grow up among the lodges as just another girl. Then maybe she and Tahanya could have... No. What was, was. With a sigh, Nitika followed the chief out into the open again. Ah, there you are. Genesita, Tahanya's mother, beamed at Nitika as round-faced and cheerful as the girl remembered. And how you've grown. My son is right, she added, much to Tahanya's embarrassment. You are a pretty young woman, and a power speaker too, and you so young. Tahanya coughed politely. My mother, don't you want to let Nitika find a place to rest? Oh, of course, of course. Come, child, enter our clan lodge in peace. Nitika had forgotten just how crowded such a lodge could be. After the quiet of the chief's home, which, by tradition, he shared with only his wives, this long, narrow place seemed to swarm with life. Children rushed up and down the central corridor, squealing, dodging the many cooking fires and the men and women who were preparing food or mending clothing, or the partitions of woven woven reeds that provided some privacy. The air was thick and warm with the smell of smoke and spices and people, Tahanya's parents, grandparents, cousins, and other kinfolk. Uh, But underneath all the cheerful domesticity, Nitika realized uneasily, was still that faint current of fear. She froze. Everyone in the lodge seemed to be turning to stare at her, this time with friendly curiosity. And hope? Was it hope? In their eyes. One little boy, too young to be wearing anything other than his own plump brown skin in the lodge's warmth, came scurrying up to her side. As Tahanya introduced him as Ketchi, one of his many cousins, the boy asked eagerly, Is it true? Are you really a power speaker? Can you work magic? Ketchi! Genesita was shocked. It's not polite to question a guest. A guest? Why did I say it like that? (laughs) Nitika smiled at the wide-eyed boy. It's all right, and I can work magic, at least a little. She focused her will as Skania had taught her and reached within herself for a spark of force. It blossomed on her open hand for a moment as a shining golden flame, then vanished back into her inner self as she released it. There was a murmur of satisfaction from the adults. Power speaker, indeed. Just like Skania. Are you satisfied? Genesita asked Ketchi, now be off with you, Nitika, dear. You've made room for you we've made room for you here on the woman's side of the lodge, here between me and Aunt Shonia. You remember her, don't you? No, Nitika didn't, but she dipped her head courteously to the old woman and received a wide, toothless grin in return. You just sit here and rest, dear, continued Genesita, patting Nitika on the arm, then come join me and my husband and that tall, skinny son of mine for dinner. At first, Nitika didn't know how to talk to Tahanya. She just couldn't get used to her old playmate being so handsome now. God, they're really, really just... We get it, you guys. Like, are you, like, 13? Can you think about anything else except boy-girl cooties? Like, chill. (laughs) Oh, and surely her magic would make him uneasy. But if he was uneasy, Tahania hid it very well. He didn't treat her as different at all, teasing her across the central fireplace, joking with her all through the dinner of stewed rabbit and acorn bread, much to the amusement of his parents and the rest of his clan kin, till Nitika was blushing and laughing as she hadn't laughed in all the years away from the people. I never knew how much I missed all this. I never knew till now how lonely I was. She had forgotten so much about her own tribe. Oh, the people did respect magic, of course they did. But they weren't afraid of it, not when it was wielded by one of their own. They knew how much a power speaker needed to be reminded that he or she was still human, still in need of human warmth and friendship. And... Love? Nitika glanced at Tahanya across the dying uh, fire, 
For a moment, his eyes were very warm indeed, and the girl wondered at the strange, lovely, bewildering stirring she felt deep within her. For a moment, no one else seemed to exist in the lodge but just the two of them. Then someone coughed, and someone else laughed, and the world rushed back and around them. Tahania reddened and looked awkwardly away. They found each other so hot, so hot. Did we mention they found each other hot? Heterosexual romance is written so badly. It really is. Like, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> you said it pretty well. Like, it's like just sexual attraction. That's all, like, love at first sight ever is. It's just sexual attraction. Even the people who are like, we're soulmates. And they write an intentionally soulmates finding each other plot. It's like all the soulmates ever seem to care about is how hot the other person is. Nobody ever actually gets to know each other. <laughs> I guess they kind of already know each other, so they're kind of skipping that part, which is kind of boring for me. I'm not really a huge fan of the um, childhood friends turned romance without like serious work into making me believe that they care about each other instead of just going oh they've always cared about each other duh okay why <laughs> nitiko pretended to be very busy preparing her sleeping robes but she couldn't stop herself from wondering is this love oh skinia you taught me many things why didn't you teach me is this love oh my god shut up <laughs> That night, for all her wariness, Nitika was unable to sleep, uh, was unable to fall asleep, asleep for what seemed an eternity. She was used to sleeping in Skinia's little hut, not in a long clan lodge like this, with so many people on either side of her, but finally she did drift into slumber, only to come wide awake again, heart racing. Aye, what was wrong? All around her, the lodge was silent and dark. A warm, friendly sort of darkness that seemed to enfold her in comfort, telling her, You belong here. These are your people. They welcome you. Nitika sighed softly, smiling. The alarm she'd felt must have been only a dream. But now she found herself unable to get back to sleep. Something was nagging at the edge of her mind, chill as a cold breeze edging under her sleeping robes. At last, the girl gave up. She scrambled back into her clothes as silently as she could, wrapping a blanket about herself for added warmth, and slipped past the hide covering the small, low doorway, out into the night, gasping with shock as the cold air bit at her lungs. That was a long sentence. It was still a long time till dawn. The sky had cleared, and the stars blazed with painful brightness. Nitika shuddered beneath their chill light, thinking of the nameless terror that hid somewhere out beyond the tribe's protective palisade. The people trusted her to help them. I can't, Nitika said softly to the night, her breath a plume in the wind in the cold. If she said it softly to the night, why is there an exclamation point? You are a power speaker, whispered Skinia's ghost voice. In training, in skill, in everything but name, you are a power speaker, believe. The air had grown very still. If Nitika opened her senses as Skania had taught her, she could feel something out there, something bitter, something hating. Without conscious thought, the girl moved softly forward, following that faint, magical thread. But then Nitika stopped short, staring. When she had entered when she had entered with Tehanya, the palisade gate had been securely latched behind them. Now it stood slightly ajar. The men who were supposed to be guarding it were curled up in their robes, huddled together against the cold, snoring. But the sense of that magical, hating, something was stronger here. And for a long, terrified moment, Nitika wanted very much to turn around and run back to the nice, warm, soft lodge. Safe lodge. To the people who were depending on her. The people who had no one else to help them. Nitika bit her lip. There was no one else. It was as simple as that. No matter how hard she tried, she couldn't pretend not to be afraid. But she couldn't just give up either. For her people's sake, she had to find out who waited out there, cold and hating. I forgot. I like to make myself small. Look at this pretty picture that has nothing to do with the story I'm reading. <laughs> um, reluctantly, the girl slipped through the gap in the palisade wall and went on. The night was very dark, the starlight cut off by the forest, but Nitika remembered Skinia's lessons and forced her mind to relax, just so. Ah, now she could see. Now she could find her way by the light of magic. 
the faint blue-white glow invisible to anyone not trained in power. Heart racing, Nitika walked on through the forest as silently as she could, letting magic guide her. The sense of chill, chill hatred grew stronger with every step, whispering of death in the air all around her. But whoever, whatever, is doing the hating doesn't seem to know I'm here. So Nitika dared steal a little closer, one hand closed tightly about her power necklaces. Carefully, she parted two bushes and saw a rocky little gully. Rain, flooding, and time had washed the earth out from under a stand of vast oak trees, leaving a network of roots exposed to form a living cave. No, wait now. Those weren't only roots. Nitika blinked and looked again. Woven into them was a lodge of sorts, an ugly little hut of branches and bits of bark so sunken into the ground that the girl could understand why even the most skillful of the people hadn't found it. The aura of hatred was so powerful here that Nitika clenched her teeth to keep them from chattering, but she didn't see anything frightening. Maybe if she edged her way around to face the front of the lodge, <clears throat> a body lay stretched out limply on the ground. A second, shadowy figure bent over it. A man's figure, surely, though there were somehow though there somehow seemed to be something very wrong with it. For a wild moment, Nitika couldn't figure out what the man meant to do. Then she saw his teeth glint, the sharp teeth of a predator beast about to strike. She saw the face of his prey. It was Tahanya. He must have been the one who left the gate ajar. He must have come out here while she'd slept. But why? Why? No time to worry about it. Nitika remembered the chief's description of bodies found in the morning, empty and forgot all caution. She plunged forward into the open. The startled predator man whirled to face her, raging, his eyes hot with hatred for all that lived. But despite those terrible eyes, something in the contorted face brought a surge of memory to Nitika's mind, of the time when Skinia had taken her from the people and left behind the other, victorious, power speaker. Gangosa? Was it truly he? Or rather, was it still he? those alien, alien eyes. The power necklaces were suddenly ablaze with magic, nearly burning her skin, reacting to his presence, as they never had to anyone before, and every nerve in her body seemed to be reacting with them, tight with alarm. And all at once, Nitika knew what was wrong. Every living thing had a faint shimmering of light playing about it, visible to those who were trained to see such things, a reflection of the life force within, but no life light played about Gungosa. No life at all. No, Nik Nitika said slowly, struggling to keep her voice from shaking. You're not Gungosa, are you? Not, not anymore. You're dead. No, not dead, the one, Gung the once Gungosa shouted. I am changed, better, more powerful. He frowned, blinking, then continued in a more nearly human tone. I knew you once. Yes, a brat child, running after that, Skania, thinking herself so strong, so mighty. Now I am the mighty one, the dead eyes stared. After she left, folk dared to mock me. They called me a liar, a sham. But I went into the forest alone. I made conjurings of power. I drew darkness to me and made it mine. Nitika winced. You called up darkness and it killed you, she corrected softly. Had she just seen Tahanya stir? Was he regaining consciousness? She must keep the once Gung Osa distracted. The darkness possessed your body. It turned you into dead alive, life stealer. Not life stealer, little one, magic stealer. The once Gung Osa gave a sharp, humorless grin. Oh yes, I kill. I take blood. I must feed to exist. But every life bears within it a touch of magic, no matter how slight. You know that. With each kill, I steal that body's magic, make it part of me. He knows, Nitika realized suddenly. The part of him that still Gungosa knows he's dead, and it's driven him insane. Somehow that seemed much more terrible than if he'd become a true dead alive, a mindless predator. The dead alive continued savagely. At last, I shall have all the magic, all. I shall be the greatest, most terrible of power speakers. His mad, terrible eyes, hot with the heart of hatred, held her transfixed. Desperately, Nitika tore her gaze away, even as the once Gangosa shrieked. And now I shall take your magic, too. He lunged, but suddenly... <clears throat> Sorry. 
Uh, he lunged, but suddenly Tahanya came to life, grabbing at the once Gungosa's leg. The being went crashing to the ground, and Tahanya leaped on top of him, yelling, Nitika, run. And then the dead alive lurched to his feet, throwing Tahanya aside without effort. The young man crashed into the trunk of a tree and crumpled, and the once Gungosa whirled to him, teeth bared. Stop it, Nitika shrieked. Get away from him. But those were only empty words. Tahanya was going to die while she stood by and did nothing. I can't do anything. I'm only an apprentice. Tahania was going to die for her sake, just as Skania had died. But that's not true, Nitika protested. She didn't die for me. She just died. It wasn't my fault. You are you are power speaker now, whispered Skania's spirit voice. Believed. Believe. Um, it was a weird something happening with the text with like like two or three of those sentences are um italicized and then it just stops in the middle of the sentence and i don't know why it was probably like some kind of spooky effect instead of a typo i assume weird <clears throat> anyway tahania was going to die and all love and joy with him no nitika shouted fiercely and sudden sharp fire blazed up within her this shall not be she laughed in wild delight as magic woke within her aching to be used Oh, Skania, you were right all along. I do have power. I was only afraid to try and fail. Dead alive, you shall not have him. And she spoke her power free. The dead alive staggered back beneath the sudden force of it, eyes wide with alarm. <clears throat> Should have. Once again, as always, I say this every freaking week. I left my water. No, I may not even have any water. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> and she spoke her power free. The dead alive staggered back beneath the sudden force of it, eyes wide with alarm. He tried to lunge at Nitika, but power blocked his leap. He tried to lun lun uh, run, but power caught him, tossed him back. With a savage hiss, the once Gungosa darted aside, diving into his lodge. Nitika called fire into being, the ever feeding, never fed, hurled it forth from her will. The lodge blazed up with white-hot, magical fire. Panting, Nitika waited, never daring to blink. At her side, Tahanya stirred, sitting up. Is it over? he asked warily. From the heart of the blaze came an eerie, an eerie howl. Man had entered. Blood-red fox raced out, dead alive transformed. Look out! Don't let him escape! Nitika caught the fox in her blanket, wrestling it to the ground, struggling to hold it pinned. The fox writhed within her grasp, yelping, shrieking. Fox had been snared. Dead white owl soared up. Dead alive transformed. Hunter quick, Tahanya hurled a stone. The owl shrieked as it was struck and fell back into the heart of the flames. Owl had fallen. Cloud of ashes whirled up. Dead alive transformed one last time. Nitika hurled her blanket over it forcing it back into the flames, holding blanket and ashes and flames together with her song till, at last, the final embers di uh, died. Warily, the girl stirred the ashes with a branch. Nothing remained. The dead alive was gone. What had been left of Gungosa was free. All at once, Nitika was too wary to stand. As she crumbled, she heard Tahanya's sharp cry of alarm, but she was already sliding helplessly into sleep. She woke to early morning grayness. She also woke to find herself in Tahanya's arms. As soon as he felt her stir, the young man hastily let her go, his face red. Are, are you all right? he asked. Nitika nodded. Skania warned me. Power speaking can be truly exhausting. Oh, Tahanya, it's true. I am a power speaker. He blinked. I never thought you weren't. You don't understand. I, what were you doing out here? I, uh, was trying to protect you. I remember leaving the lodge, but after that, Tahanya shook his head. Gangosa must have worked a spell on me, because the next thing I remember is waking up with him about to take a bite. He gave Nitika a rueful grin, a fine protector I turned out to be. If you hadn't been in danger, Nitika thought, I might never have accepted power, but of course she couldn't say that. If you hadn't thrown that stone at the owl, the dead alive would have escaped. Then we're both heroes, eh? Nitika looked up into the warmth of his eyes and all at once wanted to laugh aloud in joy. I suppose we are. But then a sudden disconcerting idea struck her. 
Sahanya, you must promise me something. Never let me get as as conceited as Gangosa. Oh, no danger of that, Tahanya scrambled up, holding out his hands to her. She had uh, she let him pull her to her feet, which she did with such enthusiasm that she was flung into his arms, held so close that their lips were nearly touching. Unless, Tahanya added breathlessly, it's conceit over being a certain someone's sweetheart. Tahanya, I'm being serious. So am I. I was, right from the instant I met you in the forest. But then, embarrassed, he hastily let her go. You were talking about using your magic, weren't you? Don't worry, I promise. I'll never let power get the better of you. It really doesn't bother you that I'm a... a power speaker? Would she ever be able to say that word without stumbling? Tahanya looked at her with genuine surprise. Why should it? Some people are born hunters, some are weavers, and some are power speakers. Exactly. Now let's get back to the lodges before they come looking for us. But Nitika hesitated for a moment, smiling, almost sure she heard the fading whisper of Skinia's spirit. You're on your own now, girl. Live. Be wise. Be happy. I will, she whispered joyfully. Oh, I will. Indeed. And that was... Oh, God. The Magic Stealer. I really need to make little cards so that you guys can, like, see the title as I'm reading. The Magic Seer by Josepha Sherman. And it was okay. I found a lot of these stories pretty cool. A lot of fun. But um, this one was just kind of mid <laughs> for me, personally. If you liked it, that's amazing. It's great. It is a good story. I just feel like um, it was too much character development and too little of time. They added, like, a couple more pages of something maybe or if they made her less conflicted and just made her a power know that she's a power speaker but she's nervous to do anything about it because this is the first time she's ever really gotten to use these powers and that's where her confidence comes in at the end of the story i think it would be more effective instead of just like yeah but come on <laughs> anyway that's my thought and I'm going to leave you with that for a couple seconds while I go get a drink of water so I stop coughing as much. I will be back. <laughs> <sighs> I've heard people, uh, people say that like I should have like a screen that says be right back or something with music playing anytime I do that but it seems like such a hassle when all I want to do is get up and walk to the kitchen that is like right in front of me <laughs> oh, so much work <laughs> let me be lazy and leave you wondering if I'm ever coming back <laughs> okay next story Avo by Mary K. Whittington, spelled A-H-V-E-L, Avil. Interesting. Bees droned among the wild roses growing on the crumbling stone wall, nested in high grass under a gnarled oak. Lily opened the book she'd received last week on her 13th birthday and breathed deeply over warm, sweet air. What luck to live next door to the old and overgrown part of the village cemetery where she could be alone, away from her four younger brothers. Before she finished the first page, she stopped, listening. Close by, someone spoke. Lily sat up and peered between the tilted headstones. An old woman, her black coat long and tattered, crouched by a grave. Relatable. <laughs> Avil, she said, I do not know what to do. 
She must be talking to the person buried there. Not wanting to be caught eavesdropping, Lily ducked beh uh, behind the grass, but curiosity made her listening. I need to read my code. This is annoying me. Yeah. Okay. Now that our sister is gone, I have been the only one left to tend you, and I grow wary, Avil. The trip is so long, so hard. I do not think I can come again. Paper rustled. The woman must have brought flowers. I wish I had been there, Avil, she was saying, for I would have guarded your body. I would have kept the cat from leaping over you, but you died before I was born. Lily wondered what a cat had to do with it. Same. <laughs> Oh, Avil, the woman said, her voice breaking. I pray nothing will disturb you, for your sake and others. Now what could that mean? As soon as the old woman was gone, Lily inspected the headstone belonging to this Avil. Strange, there were no flowers, only a braid of white bulbs curled in the depression in the front of the stone. She lifted one and sniffed. Garlic? Baffled, she tore away clumps of grass to reveal the headstone's inscription. Avil, our beloved son, born January 14th, 1894, died July 2nd, 1899. And near the stone's base, may his rest never more be broken. So he was, like, five years old? Sitting back on her heels, she wound a, strain, uh, a strand of brown hair around her fingers and pondered the mystery of it all finally deciding the old woman was crazy. Nobody talked to long-dead children about cats, and she looked pretty poor. Maybe she couldn't afford flowers, and those garlic bulbs were all she'd had. Five, year, five years old Avil had been when he died. The same age as Lily's youngest and favorite brother, Nathan. If he were lying here, she shuddered at the thought, she'd bring him flowers, lots of them. On impulse, she picked up the garlic, headed toward the groomed lawns of the newer part of the cemetery, and dropped the braid in the trash can. When she returned, she gathered an armload of wild roses and piled them against Avil's stone. That's better, she said, got her book, and went home. What a little brat. <laughs> Damn. God. Guess what, Mama said at supper that night. The Potter boys are staying with us a few days. Their mother's expecting relatives, and she needs all the room she can get. Lily's brothers, except for Nathan, erupted into loud approval. Lily groaned. Shortly after she had washed the last dish, the back door banged open and in trooped a small army of boys, her tow-headed brothers leading the dark-haired potters carrying sleeping bags. Mama grabbed the oldest boy. Is this all of you? she asked. I guess so, he answered. Except Tommy, our cousin. He wasn't sure he wanted to come. He might, though. Where do we sleep? On the living room floor, two of Lily's brothers shouted, Come on. Wrestling and pushing, the mob crammed through the door and thundered toward the front room, Mama right behind. Hey, Lil. Nathan, Lily's only quiet brother, stood back by the back porch window looking out. Stood by the back porch window looking out. Hey, yourself. Why aren't you with the others? Mama says they're going to watch a scary movie, and she doesn't want me to see it, and I have to sleep in my own bed. He didn't sound too disappointed. Hey, who's that? Lily peered out the window into the dusk. Standing alone by the back steps was a boy, a little shorter than Nathan. Tommy, she thought. She opened the door. Come on in, she said. Just, But he didn't move. He's just bashful. He's just bashful, she told Nathan, although she couldn't imagine any relation of the Potters being shy. Outside, she took the boy's hand, surprisingly icy on such a warm evening. Ooh, wait. Can you see? Can you see? Can you, you can see it now. All the effort I put in. <laughs> oh, God. It was a horrible angle to read this book by, though. Oh, gosh. Let's go, Tommy, she said, and pulled him up, unprotesting into the house. Saying nothing, the boy hung his head so she could not see his face, only his hair, dark and shaggy. Nathan pointed, those are sure funny clothes. I mean, I know, I know the implications. We all understand the implications. But it's a lot funnier to think that she just saw a boy hanging out and she just dragged him into her house. <laughs> She's like, hey, hey, kid, don't be so shy. Come on in. <laughs> it's a complete stranger dragging a poor child into her house. <laughs> 
Those are, uh, Nathan pointed. Those are funny clothes. Probably hand-me-downs, Lily said. But odd, she thought. Somehow old-fashioned. Like pictures she'd once seen in a book. The stained white shirt resembled a sailor's, its wide collar edged with faded blue stripes. The pants were gathered below the knee. The boy's bare legs were pale, his socks and shoes white with gray stains. He didn't bring a sleeping bag, Nathan observed. Where's he going to sleep? How about your spare bed? That's what Mama would suggest. If Nathan was too young for scary movies, so was Tommy. Okay, he can use my old pajamas. While she and Nathan made up the bed, Tommy wandered around the room, touching Nathan's collection of stuffed animals one by one. Finally, he chose a dark-furred boy and held it tightly against his chest. You can sleep with Bear tonight, Nathan offered, climbing into bed. Lily clicked on the bedside, tab uh, the bedside lamp and rummaged through the bureau's bottom drawer. Here you go, she said, pulling out Nathan's old pajamas with their pattern of red balloons against a blue sky. Hey, Nathan asked Tommy, you sick or something? Of course he's not sick, she turned and stared. In the light of the lamp, Tommy's face was so gaunt. His cheekbones cast shadows upon his pale skin. Glancing at her with deep-set gray eyes, he slowly licked his lips, and she caught a glimpse of white teeth. He wouldn't have come if he were sick, she said, hoping she was right. Come on, Tom, let's put these on. As she helped him undress, she wondered again about his clothing and his fingernails. How could she have missed those, so long and curved? His mother must never cut them or give him baths. He smelled musty. You going to tell a story, Nathan asked. Don't I always? Maybe Tommy had been sick. He seemed so weak, and he certainly didn't weigh very much, she thought as she lifted him into bed. Which story do you want? Three bears, Nathan said promptly. Again? Well, all right. She sat next to Tommy, her back against the headboard. To her surprise, he clambered into her lap, hugging Bear. Poor little kid, she thought. I bet no one ever tells you stories, either. Cuddling him, she tried to warm his thin body. Once upon a time, she began. Good night, Lil, Nathan said after Goldilocks had run away into the forest and Lily had tucked the boys in. Tommy said nothing, but he smiled. Sweet, Lily thought, and snapped off the light. To continue the, um... The creepy vibes i am going to pause to put the sweater i'm sitting on on <laughs> it may uh, be daylight savings time and almost spring but it is still cold here oh oh my god where's the armhole <laughs> <sighs> yeah it was snowing earlier today actually it's kind of crazy because it seemed to just start snowing very quickly and then stop snowing very quickly Whatever, you're not here for the weather. We're going back to the story. I have my sweater on. <laughs> Early next morning, Nathan woke her. Lil, I don't feel good. She put her hand on his forehead. No fever, but he was certainly pale, she thought. As pale as... His name's not really Tommy, Nathan whispered in her ear. He talked to me after you left. His real name's funny. Avil. What? Her sleep-fogged mind churned. Where had she heard that name? In the cemetery? A child's grave. He was gone when I woke up, Nathan said. He left his clothes in Bear, but he took my pajamas. I woulda let him have Bear. Nathan rubbed his neck. Ow, something's bitten me. A mosquito, maybe. She looked, finding two reddish punctures, like the, like, like the marks teeth might make. Sharp teeth, spaced out about an inch apart. Which would, What would make a bite like, wow. Why am I stumbling so much? Don't grab the candle to drink it. That would be bad. Sh um, like the marks teeth might make. Sharp teeth spaced about an inch apart. What would make a bite like that? Raising herself on her one elbow, she gently touched the wounds, forcing her hands to stop trembling. Avil. No. Not possible. Trying to swallow the tightness in her throat, she sat on the edge of the bed, remembering scary stories she'd read of people using garlic to protect against evil beings, like werewolves or vampires. Avil, I pray nothing will disturb you, the old woman had said. What if the garlic she had played on the grave uh, she had placed on the grave was supposed to keep him there? And because the lily had taken the bulbs away, he would now get out. No, that little boy she tucked in last night, he couldn't be a vampire. But suppose he were. She gazed horror-stricken at Nathan, curled up beside her. 
If he died, then he might become a vampire too. She shook her head. This was crazy. Vampires didn't really exist. Wiping sweaty palms on her sheet, she figured she'd go to the cemetery later, hunt through that trash can for the garlic, and put it back, just in case. You're tired, she told Nathan. I woke up at two, and those boys were still noisy. They kept you from sleeping. Mm. He didn't open his eyes. Worried, she shook him awake. Tell you what, she said lightly to hide her fear. I'll fix you a good breakfast for all, uh, all for yourself before everybody else gets up. In the kitchen, she sat Nathan at the table, closed the kitchen door, and searched the refrigerator for meat. That's what he needed. She got out cheese and hamburger patties, cooking them in the microwave so the smell wouldn't announce breakfast to the rest of the household. After two cheeseburgers, some of the color returned to Nathan's face. He said he felt better, but she sent him back to bed for a nap anyway. Put all those things in my closet, she said, and don't say anything to Mama about him, all right? Why not, he asked. He's our secret. Nathan nodded, and she knew he'd never tell. He liked keeping secrets. The trash can was empty. Braiding herself for not coming earlier, Lily plodded back to Oval's stone. Please don't drink the candle. <laughs> I'm going to drink the candle. <laughs> <laughs> don't drink while i'm laughing either jesus christ i'm gonna die on stream oh god i don't know she's pretty smart though this kid like i wouldn't have known what to do with the kid who woke up like sick like nathan was i if i was like 12 i don't know what i would have done i may not have made him a meat sandwich and he probably needed it for like i don't know the iron or something She's pretty dumb for a 12-year-old, but pretty smart at the same time. The trash can was empty, berating herself for not coming earlier. Lily plodded back to Avil's stone. I tried, she muttered, noticing that the roses lay as she had left them the afternoon before. Except, she bent for a closer look. Those holes in the earth on either side of their flowers hadn't been there yesterday. Escape holes? I'm going for more garlic, she said. You're not getting out tonight if I can help it. That would be traumatizing. <laughs> That'd be a fun story you could tell it for, uh, for your other, uh, for your boyfriend. Tell your boyfriend I died on stream. Do it for the vine. Uh, I'm going for more garlic, she said. You're not taking, uh, uh, getting out tonight if I can help it. Taking five dollars, all she had left for her birthday money, she rode her bike to the village market. Yep, that's the only garlic we have left, the cheerful clerk told her. We'll be getting some th more tomorrow. Jesus, wait, what? Do I <laughs> In the 90s, you could just run out of garlic at your grocery store? Good to know. Tomorrow night might be too, uh, no, tomorrow might be too late, Lily thought after paying him and leaving the store. Glowering at the undersized bulb, she was sure it could never keep Oval in his grave. How much more blood could Nathan lose before? Tonight, she'd string the cloves and hang them around his neck, telling him they were medicine to make him feel better. That was sort of true, and she'd let him bring his sleeping bag into her room, tell him stories as the bigger boys would be doing out in the living room, and she'd guard him while he slept. But she couldn't do uh, that every night. Soon she would have to deal with Oval for good. There must be a way. She crossed the street and entered the library to do some research. The book was thick and full of tiny print, but she found what she was looking for. A chapter on stopping vampires. Highly recommending the driving of stakes through hearts, it also gave another other methods. After borrowing the book, she took it home, knowing she'd have hours to read it. Although the night was warm, she kept her door and windows closed, and her bedroom soon reeked of garlic. Like pizza, Nathan had said before falling asleep. Six cloves, strung on thread, hang from, uh, hung from his neck. The seventh lay on her night table next to her alarm clock, now reading quarter to three. In less than two hours, the sun would rise, but Avil had not yet come. Perhaps having fed the night before, he was not hungry. Earlier, she had worried he might bite someone else in the house, but the book said vampires usually returned to the same victim again and again. Not this time, she whispered, gazing at the window, at the reflection of lamp and closet and bed, at her own image. Suddenly rigid, she squinted at two pinpricks of red light near the window sill. Eyes. 
Her skin prickled as she recognized Avil's face pressed to the glass outside. How long had he been watching? <laughs> How pressed was his face to the- He was just like, Bleh. Is it like smushed? Is he like smushing his nose and staring at her? <laughs> I'm going to take care of you, she muttered fiercely. You'll never hurt my brother again. I know what to do to you now. Whether Abel heard her, she could not tell, for he stared past her at the sleeping boy. Quickly, she put on her jacket, slipped the extra garlic clove in her pocket, and grabbed a bulging paper bag from the closet. Before opening her door, she, she surveyed the room. The smell alone should be enough to keep Abel out, she thought. Yesterday, when she'd sniffed the garlic on the grave, it hadn't been nearly as strong. Almost smiling, she tiptoed out of the house, picking up the shovel on the way. Hurrying, for light was sifting into the eastern sky, she headed for the cemetery wall. She must be at the grave before Avil returned. In the cemetery, she stood knee-deep in grass, feeling dew soak through her jeans, chilling her. Her peaceful refuge of the day now filled her with fear. Gravestones loomed. The oak reached for her with skeletal fingers. With a shudder, she hid behind a stone bearing a moss-covered angel, which gave her scant com comfort. She peered at Avil's grave. He would, he would come soon, for, according to the book, vampires abhorred daylight, which was gradually approaching. Gripping her shovel, Lily waited. Something moved near the wall. She hunkered down, her other hand in her jacket pocket, clutching the garlic clove, her eyes wide, trying to see. Silently, Avil moved toward her hiding place, stopping close by, slowly peering around as if suspecting her presence. With her thumbnail, she pierced the garlic, ready to draw it from her pocket, pocket, hurl it at him. But then he moved away to stand by his headstone, shaking with relief, she breathed again. In the half-light, he looked vulnerable, not the evil being the book told about, but a lonely child, wearing a cast-off pair of pajamas too large for him. Turning his face skyward, he opened his mouth and bared his fangs. Then he dissolved into a luminescent mist that seeped into the holes by the headstone and was gone. She must not waste time. Within an hour, the cemetery gate would be open, and she should be finished by then. She began to dig, thinking about what the library book had said about cats. If one jumps over a person newly dead, he shall turn into a vampire. Poor, innocent Avil, who'd had no choice in what he had become. The soil resisted the shovel at first, but softened as she dug further, sweating with exertion and anxiety, for the sun was rising. About four feet down, the shovel's blade unearthed a long, thick splinter of wood. Of course, a ninety-year-old coffin would be decayed. Lying on her stomach, Lily reached into the hole and grabbed the wood, shaking, uh, stacking it by the listing headstone. Under the last shards, she glimpsed the blue and red of Nathan's pajamas. The sight stopped her, but she knew she must go on if her brother was to live. She wrenched the wood away. Avil, she breathed, looking down into his face, its eyes half open, fixed, and at the unnaturally red lips, which should be redder, she thought, had he fed again the past night. Lily shuddered, glad she did not have to drive a stake through the thin chest, slowly rising and falling, but the other way, the gentler way. She hoped she would be able to do that. I'm here to save you, she said through chattering teeth. You and Nathan. Hanging from the edge of the hole, she lifted Avil's shoulder, pushed at the opposite hip, and rolled him over so that he lay face down. She hoped the book was right, that only if vampires were laying face up could they raise from their graves. Standing, she stretched the strain from her back. At the bottom of the grave ray, uh, lay Avil, resembling nothing more than a little boy, his hair tousled, pajamas rumpled, asleep. Lily reached into the paper bag for the clothing he had worn when she had first seen him. Instead of smooth cloth, she felt something furry, bare, just like Nathan, she thought, to fold the toy into the clothes before stuffing them into her closet. She took them out and laid them over, oval like a coverlet, putting, him sh putting his shoes by his feet. Last, she tucked Bear in beside him. Brushing away unexpected tears, she found herself humming the lullaby Mama sometimes sang to Nathan. Sleep well, Lily whispered and picked up the shovel. Aww. Okay, what is this? Doo -doo -doo. Oval by Mary Kay Whittington. That was a sweet little story with a sweet little ending.
sweet like he, he wasn't chomping on her brother it was a sweet ending yeah it was a good story no i like that they made her kind of a know-it-all brat at the beginning because like what other person how else would you i don't know start the story where this kid who's been stopped from raising from uh, his grave for a hundred years or however just starts up again you know just got to get someone in there to screw things up and then have to deal with the consequences i liked it i hope you liked it <laughs> okay mm. i like this book so far but it is shorter it is the shortest one we've read which is frustrating because i don't get to read as long every night um every streaming night as i like to I either, um, cause, uh, in the other books, about three stories was about two hours long. And I like to go about two hours long. But these are, I only take, like, a, a little over an hour to read. <laughs> I feel bad for the little child vampire. Yeah. I didn't know that, um, I don't know if this book made it up, but I didn't know about the cat jumping over a, a newly dead person can turn them into a vampire. And I don't think people generally take it seriously, the um, flipping them over so they can't raise, rise from the grave. I feel like I've heard that before, but I don't know if I've ever really heard people actually doing it, ex out of, like, a silly little, like, comedy story. You know? Usually they just try to kill it so that it's dead for good. Never heard that. Yeah. It was a clever story. I liked it. <laughs> okay. Uh, the more I read, the less I'm going to have to read. Ugh. Okay. Well, we'll see how we feel after this one. Blood Libel by Leigh Ann Hussey. And what a shit way to turn into a vampire. Yeah. Yeah. Truly. I was thinking, like, have you ever, we, you and me, you and me, Bessie, have had this conversation. This is for anybody else who stumbles across this. My whole, like, if I'm ever murdered, I want to be murdered spectacularly. I want them to do it in the most gruesome way possible, and I want them to never be found. I want them to get away with it, because I think that is funny. <laughs> if I was going to be turned into a vampire, I want it to be brutal and tragic and <laughs> disgusting. I want them to have fun with it. And I want to be traumatized the rest of my undead life. <laughs> because I think that that's the only way it would be worth it. <laughs> like, like, if I was just like a cat jumped over my body and I'm a vampire, that sucks. But if like a vampire stalked me for weeks and then like fucked with me for weeks and then turned me into a vampire that'd be neat that'd be cool that's a cool story okay <laughs> hmm. i don't want to see what response you have to this <laughs> so i'm gonna keep going blood libel by lay and hussy adam staggered a little as he walked such a night it had been, a little more schnapps than was good for him he had had, maybe. But did not the law say that the Sabbath was for rejoicing, and the announcement of a wedding still more cause for joy, and how much more so when it was his own sister who was to be wed? He had felt big with pride when his brother-in-law-to-be had invited him to drink with the men of the families. True, he had been an adult by law since his bar mitzvah three years ago, but being able to drink with the men, that was much more real. So he would be like 16. His own marriage had been delayed somewhat because of his studies. Maybe when he had finished them, Adam would be able to marry his own sweetheart. Rachel had already been chosen for him, but luckily she would be easy for him to love. What a wedding that would be for the rabbi's best student. His mind was far away under a wedding canopy, and Adam never heard the step behind him. All at once, there were powerful arms around him. Before he could even begin to struggle or cry out, he felt a sharp pain near his throat, and the night was suddenly blacker. He woke slowly, his head throbbing, and no wonder after last night. 
What a horrible dream he had had. But of course, it had been only a dream, for who would want to cut his throat here in his safe little village? Thank God he was now awake, and indeed, with his eyes still closed, he did thank God in the words of the prayer for waking. Did you just hear my phone go off? I could have sworn I... I'm using it as a webcam, and I could have sworn I told I turned notifications off. Ignore that. <laughs> oh, God. Where even was I? He woke slowly, his head throbbing, and no wonder, after last night, what a horrible dream he had had. But of course it had been only a dream, for who would want to cut his throat here in his safe little village? Thank God he was now awake, and indeed, with his eyes still closed, he did thank God in the words of the prayer for waking. I give thanks unto thee, O King, who liveth and endureth, who hath mercifully restored my soul unto me. Great is thy faithfulness. He couldn't have found his way home somehow, because whatever he lay on was hard. Maybe he was in a side street somewhere. Heavens, if he had not come home last night, his mother would be worried. He must rise immediately. It was still dark. Perhaps it was yet before dawn, and he could slip in and sit at his desk as if he had studied Torah all night. Yes. But what was the matter with his arms? Why, why could he not rise? Was he bound? Had he fallen among thieves after all? He shouted, and his voice bounced right back to him as though he faced a wall, but it was somehow muffled. And then he felt the cloth on his face and smelled the sweet anointing oils and new terror. He was buried alive. His screams drowned the sound of rending cloth as he struggled in his shroud and he blindly beat his fists against the wood as he wept and prayed for health. He felt the box splinter before him and then there was earth in his face. Miracle, but had he broken free of his coffin only for the earth to smother him? Surely God was with him and gave him Samson's strength as he reached and scrabbled over him. Uh, throwing the loose earth into the empty space of his coffin, driving upward with clenched teeth and tight shut eyes, sitting up, then trying to stand by pushing himself up on the dirt he had thrown behind him. Then his hand touched air. Out of the grave he climbed, naked and dirt covered, as he had come from the womb, naked and bathed in the blood of his mother. Gross. He sat on the edge of the hole and wept for relief. It was night still. But was it the same night? It could not have been. What sickness had he had that he should have slept a whole day, that his family should have thought him dead and buried him? How many days had it been? Thank God there had been enough air for him to live until he woke. But he must go home, tell them that he was still alive. What joy then? He reached back into the hole, snatched the torn shroud to cover his nakedness, and ran out of the graveyard. When he threw open his front door, he saw that they were still were all sitting in mourning for him, and the rabbi was there. Look, everybody, I'm not dead, he cried. There was complete silence. White faces turned up to him. Then his small sister began to wail in fear, and the rabbi, his beloved teacher, rose up with anger and fear in his face. Get you gone, spirit, the rabbi roared. By the holy name of God, I command you to leave this place. But wait, master, I'm not dead, I swear it. There was more shouting now, and screaming, and nobody would touch him or listen to him, and the rabbi stood before him like the angel defending the tree of life, with power like a fiery sword in his hands. Even his mother turned away. Before he knew what was, ha before he knew what had happened, Adam had fled the house and was walking bewildered down the street. What could have happened that his family should turn against him? Surely in the bright day they would come to their senses, but he would have to find somewhere to wait. He passed Dove, the butcher's shop. He didn't like to look at the raw sides of meat Dove hung there to keep cool in the nights of oncoming winter, and would have turned his face as usual. But he suddenly knew he was not cold, for all his near nakedness, and more, that the bloody meat he usually found repulsive was luring his steps toward it. Suddenly, he went a little mad. Without even thinking, he opened the door he knew would be unlocked, reached in, and snagged a leg of lamb, slipped out again, and fled the street. When he came to his senses, he tasted blood in his mouth and found that he had been tearing at the meat like some kind of animal. Horrified, he threw the shredded thing from him. 
What was the matter with him? He must go to the ritual bath and clean himself, assuming he, he could be cleaned now. The dawn was breaking, and he stood up to greet the sun, but how hot its rays were, burning him. Again, his feet moved without his will, propelling him into the shadows. The village was beginning to stir, and when people came out, seeing him naked and filthy, the women turned and ran from him, shrieking. Men tore their shirts, crying for God to forgive them. He fled the village, overcome. Damn. <laughs> Later that day, he hid behind a tree in the graveyard and watched people come and wail over his empty grave. He dared not show himself as the rabbi sifted the earth between his fingers, scowling. The rabbi was still angry with him somehow, but Adam was in his so but Adam in his sorrow could not guess why. As the days passed and Adam hid from the sun by day and the people by night, he realized what had befallen him. The daylight hurt him. Such food as he could steal, good food, was not nourishing him. His family shunned him. One night, he sat and thought as he used to in study, engaging himself in rab rabbinic dialogue. What is the evidence? What are the indications? These things combine somehow. It is said, but not by the rabbis, no. It is said in whispers in the dark that these things can mean but one thing. Yes, I have been attacked indeed. I have been attacked indeed, but by no mere cutthroat. Here he broke into hysterical sobbing cackle. Bite throat was more like it. I have been robbed, thieved of my life, too young, by Nosferatu, the immortal evil. Now I am Nosferatu myself. And when he knew this, he beat his breast in grief. At first, he tried not to eat. Not only was it against religious law for him to consume blood, but also his thoughts were repulsed by the idea... <laughs> I think you're past religious law, buddy. God. But that could not last. His head might have shunned blood, but his animal hunger could not long be controlled. Then he bethought himself of the exception to the law. Any of the laws may be set aside to save one's life, if it is a matter of life and death. He did not know how the law applied to him, since he was neither alive nor dead. But then, none of the laws might apply to him anymore. It was only for the conscience he still had that he tried to rationalize his appetite. He came to his grave one day, hiding in the shadows, trying still to behave like a normal man. So it was some while after dawn. Somebody was lying on the ground there. Who? He ran up calling, Can I help? But the one on the ground there had been helped as much as he would ever be. So, said he, looking down on the stout stake of wood jutting up from the other's chest, so you returned, and they caught you. And as he looked, the rays of the sun touched the one on the ground, and where the light touched, ashes were left. See here, he said, I do not suppose you will mind if I change clothes with you. This way, my mother will know for certain that I am dead when they come back and see my fringed shirt on your ashes. Perhaps it was dark when they caught you, eh? And you did not reckon with the strength of so many? So, for all the pain you caused, you will help me relieve at least one pain. Flinching a bit from the sunlight, he carefully took up the stake and shook the ashes out of the old clothes. Then he laid his own garment down on the ashes. And this is for my pain, he whispered, stabbing the stake down again. He threw the old clothes into his grave and threw dirt on them. Now I am dead indeed, he said, looking down at the stake through his garment. But now this naked body has a new life. He did not want to prey upon his own people. So that night he slipped like a ghost into his own house, where all were asleep, sitting up in chairs in the front room. They must all be exhausted, he thought. Now they need not fear to sleep. He looked at his mother's face for a moment, grieving for how old she looked. Then he crept around to his room and gathered up another fringed shirt and other clothes. He paused a moment over his phylacteries, 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 <laughs> the bindings for his arms, considering. No, he thought, they will never miss my clothes, but would they, what these they would miss, and wonder what they were gone, and wonder that they were, wow, I messed that up. They will never miss my clothes, but these they would miss, and wonder that they were gone in fear. 
He went out the window, not daring the squeaking of door hinges again, and dressed quickly in the moonlight. Then he returned to his grave, took a little earth from it, and put it in a small sack made of his shroud cloth to wear about his neck, such as pilgrims took earth from Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem. Has it not been said, he said to himself, that the Nosferatu must stay near his grave? This way I need not stay, for I will carry its earth with me. And like the Jews from Jerusalem, am I not myself exiled from my own land? He glanced around. Here is my beloved home, the village where I grew up. For that very reason I cannot stay, leaving, thieving for my own people, he said firmly to fortify himself. It would not be easy. He put the sack around his neck and left his old home without looking back. Going from place to place, he found other villages, Jewish and not. But even living by night, he soon became familiar with the lives and people of those places. Here comes the milkman, talking to himself as usual, he would murmur. In a minute, the marriage broker will come out and ask him for the 115th time when he will marry his daughters. And each time, after a week or two, he would tell himself, It is too soon, but I must leave. Now I know these people. <clears throat> oh, God. Now I know these people and wish not to harm them, and I do not know when I might lose control and attack one of them. At last, he took to the woods, trying to find a place as far away from humankind as possible. He hated to hunt because that too was prohibited by the law, and he hated to kill animals when he could see their fear, for that was also prohibited. But always, he reassured himself, any of the laws may be set aside to save your life. In the days that passed, he slept where he could find places out of the sunlight, in the hollows of trees, under rocks, in the abandoned dens of animals, and he came to live like an animal, hunting his food at night, always moving, never staying in one place. After a time, he could scarcely remember the name by which he had been called. Still, he was drawn to the places where people lived, despite himself. Often he would find himself standing at the edge of the wood, looking out at the houses of men. Then, shaking himself, he would flee back into the trees. Winter dragged on. <clears throat> he pounced on a rabbit he had stalked a long while one night, and just as quickly, men sprang out of the trees. You filthy poacher, one growled. You think it is still easy to steal from our lord, even now, when you know we are more watchful because food is so short? Hey, men, what shall we do with him? said another. The punishment is clear, said a third in lofty tones. His hand must be cut off. Then hold him fast, said the first one, drawing a forester's axe. They laid hold of him and stretched out his arm, and again he went mad. He flung their binding hands from him, feeling the Samson's strength still with him, hearing the sound of breaking bones. He heard the twang of a crossbow and turned toward it hurling the bowman stunned into the snow before he noticed the bolt in his side. He pulled it out and ran from there, not caring where he went as long it was as it was deeper into the woods. And only after he had run so far he did not know where he was did it once occur to him that the bolt had not wounded him at all. Thank God he had not killed them. I cannot eat, he told himself. I must not. Perhaps if I could fast... Perhaps I would become weak and then be no danger to any living thing. So when night came, instead of prowling like a wolf, he stayed put, trying to pray and think pious thoughts. He stayed so for a long time. Then, one night, he came up uneasily out of a dream in which he was walking, walking without stopping. And as he came more awake, he found that he was on his feet, moving. He stopped himself with some effort, leaning against a tree. Only the darkness of the forest can, uh, can have saved me from the day's sun, he thought. And then he looked up and saw the roofs and roads of human homes. Even in his sleep, he was drawn to them. It was a town this time. He did not know what kind or where. He moved through it like a shadow. When he heard footsteps on the cobbles, his head told him to retreat so as not to be seen. But already he was moving forward, treading silently as a cat. And then he smelled blood and was leaping on a blonde-haired man who came into his sight. But it had been a long time since he had eaten, and he was weak. 
Also, he had come upon the man face to face. So the man shouted and tried to defend himself. Help! Help! Thieves! Murder! Help! shouted the man, while the attacker hung on, silent and grim, snapping with gleaming teeth. And then there was a light on the street, and a door was flung open. A dark-clad man with a full white beard rushed out and pulled them apart. The attacker sank to the stones. Bless you, said the victim. May your God reward you for your timeliness. And as for you, he turned to the other with anger in his eyes and clenched fists. Now, none of that, said the older man. Remember your own humanity. As for you, what a fellow like yourself is doing in this part of the town at this hour, I know not, nor wish to know. Get back outside the gate the same way you got inside it. Really, I do not know what the town is coming to, with all sorts of God knows what kind of people coming in here. Go on, I'll deal with this one next. Go. And he shooed him away like a hen wife shoes chicks. The older man watched until he was sure the fellow had done as commanded. Then he turned and said, not unkindly, Surely there is yet another way for you than that of the night creature, stranger. The Nosferatu shook his head and his voice came rasping from disuse. I have tried them all. Come now, there is always another way. God has not given us a head that we should scorn his gift. Come in with me and eat, and we shall see if your burden may not be lighted by sharing. But it is eating that is the problem, he began. Come, let us not stand in the street and wake all the neighborhood. I am Simcha ben Hayim, and I see by the fringes of your garment, though it is dirty and beyond pair, that you too are a Jew. We must all care for each other in these times, not so? Simcha lifted him up and helped him inside, but if he could not eat what the other man put before him, neither could he hope to explain his affliction. He put his head in his hands, shuddering from weakness and sorrow. He felt a touch on his shoulder, and the older man's low, rich voice said, Now, my son, do not despair. You are among your own people. And he cried even harder, chokingly, without tears. But the gentle voice said soothing words, asking, Now tell me your name and your story. Simcha was a good listener, and after the story was done, he sat silent for yet for a while. Finally, he said, Well, you are not the man you were, so you should not keep the name you had. Your old name came from a group of words sketching a constellation of ideas, and a mere two letters, Dalet and Mem, the earth, the color red, blood, Adama, Adam, Dam. Our father Adam was made of the red earth of the garden, and blood is red. Shall we call you Damish? He nodded. I am Damish. So, Simcha said, and he thought a little more, a little bit more, while Damish, feeling human for the first time in months, looked around him for a little, with a little more interest. More books than he had ever seen cluttered every flat surface, many of them open. There was a sheaf of papers piled near one open book, the top sheet half covered in a neat hand. The nearest book he saw contained the words of the Torah with the ta amim notations for singing them written above. He looked at his host with new understanding. That book alone might indicate that Sim Simcha was a cantor, but all the other books, their spines showing names of books of the Talmud, the Talmud showed that Damish's host was a rabbi. And so many books, Books. Uh, surely this man was a greater rabbi than the one who had banished Thomas from his old home. But the smell of leather reminded Damish of home. He shook himself and turned back to his host. <sighs> very, uh, very uh, religious so far. Damn. As I see it, Simcha was saying, your problem is not that you are Nosferatu, but that you are a man alone. A man without a community is not a man, but an animal. And a Jew without a community is not a Jew. Must we not have a minyan, ten men together, even to celebrate Shabbat? Sh sh Shabbat? 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 Um, how much more so must we seek each other out in need? You see, you have only partially understood the law. You have much yet to learn. Indeed, to save your life, you may set aside the laws of the Torah. I'll accept these two. You must not deny God, and you must not kill another man. And are not these things one and the same? To kill a man is to destroy the world, say the sages, and to destroy the world is to deny God, for the world is God's creation. And again, as you have denied yourself the community, you have killed yourself as a Jew. 
So your rabbi turned you out? Then he has made an error, but you must not compound the error yourself. And to be sure, your concern for the law shows that you have still the soul of a man and a Jew. You must not deny that soul by living like an animal. Damash was torn between despair and exhilaration. At last, to be again with another human being, to be thinking good thoughts, to speak of holy things, and yet, what am I to do, he asked. That is a simple matter, Rabbi Samish. Simcha replied, We will take you in and give you charity. You shall drink from each of us a little in turn. None shall be drained of blood and die, so none shall become Nasratu. How can I take your charity? Take comfort, said the rabbi. Through you we are doing good deeds. But Damish objected, Why should you do this thing? I am a stranger. You don't know me. The rabbi chuckled, Now I know you are a Jew. You are as contentious contentious as the rest of us does it not say in the Haggadah all who are hungry let them come and eat Damish thought for a little while then he said shall I be a night shamas I can take care of the synagogue at night when your own shamas is asleep perhaps there are those here who have sleepless nights as I have who wish to comfort themselves and study Simcha was nodding that is a good thought Nathan Nathan could use the help, and Hillel says, lift your brother up, so be it. Then as Damish watched, the rabbi started rummaging around on his desk. He came up with a penknife and drew the blade across his left palm. Before Damish could speak, Simcha held out the bleeding hand, like a cup of wine. Damish's throat choked with dry tears. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the world, he said, saying the prayer for a meal, and looking at Rabbi Simcha, he said, blessed are you, before he touched his lips to that gift. Rabbi Simcha was indeed a better rabbi than Damish's old teacher. It took a most eloquent Talmudist to convince the community that it should support a vampire, and indeed there was a great deal of argument back and forth, but at last... Simcha convinced them all that it was the best way, and after a while, life settled down around Damish and his blood need. Each night, after supper, someone of the community would come and sit with Damish for a while, talking with him on scholarly matters. Everyone found him a willing talker and a good one. Surely an evil being could not think the holy thoughts to which Damish gave voice. Ye Yehuda, Yehuda, the cantor pointed out one day, well, anybody who lives all the time among the holy books cannot help but have a little holiness rub off on him. Not so. The men sitting around the pickle barrel nodded sagely. Yit, Zack, the printer snorted. Because a horse brushes up against a brick wall and gets red dust on him does not mean the horse is made of brick. Still, he speaks well, said Yeuda, and listens well, and the conversation moved on to other topics. When an evening with Damish was done, the visitor would cut himself, some less willingly than others, but it would not do to have Damish bite them like an animal, and Damish would take as little as he could. One evening, Nathan did not come as usual to wake him, and Damish rose a little later than usual. He said his prayers, dressed, and hurried to the synagogue. He was preparing an apology as he stepped up to the door, but loud, unhappy voices froze his words on his tongue. And why should we not give him to them? He is nothing but a stranger who does nothing for us. Yes, and who knows, but that it, but that it is he who is stealing their children. Who knows what he does in the night with none to see him? I tell you, he is a Jew, and shame be on us if we give him to them. That was Nathan's voice. Would you give them to your brother, your cousin, your neighbor? Would you tell them a Jew from another ghetto was bleeding Christian children for matzah? Voices, rised, uh, voices raised and shouted all together, but Damish was already retreating from the door. On silent feet, he moved down the street, his mind working furiously. What was this rubbish? Someone was accusing the Jews here of stealing Christian children? How could that even be conceivable? Christians were ignorant of Jewish ways, yes, but to go so far as to say Jews might consume blood. He stopped. I am a Jew, he whispered to himself. And I consume blood. Yes. And these Jews were thinking of handing him over to their accusers, that he might bear their fear away from them like the scapegoat. His own fear moved him into the shadows where he might not be seen. 
Even there, he kept thinking, if these Jews did turn him over to the Christians, perhaps during the daylight when he was weak, might not the Christians then have still more reason to believe in their own ridiculous slander? Given one Jew who took blood, might they not be all the more willing to believe the next accusation? That would lead to pogroms for certain, with the whole community wiped out. No, Damish said out loud. I will not let that happen here. For all that, some of his own people might wish to take a victim, of, make a victim of him. Damish knew them now and loved them. He must find a way to expose the lie, not only to save himself, but to save them. He spent that night in hunting, as he had in his animal days, but this time he hunted the truth as intensely as he ever hunted for food. He knew he could move swiftly, silently, unseen, and untiring. Dark deeds run in the night, and the night was his time. Night and blood, his elements. I will find the truth of this blood libel, he promised himself. For all his prowling, he found no clue that night, nor the next. During the days, he avoided the ghetto, even though he knew that it made him look all the more guilty in the eyes of his people. Still, he was unwilling that they catch him asleep and make the fatal error. Thieves and prostitutes he found, and midnight assignations, it's assignations, but of kidnappings he saw none. At each new wickedness he saw, he became angry, angry at how the big town fostered it, and angrier that he could not find the one wickedness he sought. Then, the third night, near the ghetto, Damash saw someone climb from open shutters with a sack on his back. Not unusual that, in a town crawling with footpads, but this sack moved and made little muffled noises. Damish, Damish's lips slid away from his teeth in a snarling grin, and he moved quietly, quietly through the shadows, downwind of the burglar. The scent of clean spring breeze brought to his nose left him no doubt. There was a human in the sack, young and frightened. Damish had an animal's keen sense of smell, and he knew. Silently, as the kidnapper moved, Damish was more silent. Uh, okay. <laughs> Silently, as the kidnapper moved, Damish was more silent. Once, when there was no place for Damish to hide, the kidnapper looked around as though a sixth sense had warned him. It was the blonde-haired man he had leaped upon so many days past. Frozen to the spot, Damish desperately willed the man not to see him, and maybe the kidnapper's glance passed over him. Maybe, Damish thought, I am not worthy of notice, but he guessed that as Nosferatu, he had some kind of influence over a mind. Still, he took care not to be seen again as he followed the man to a wretched little house on the outskirts of town. Damish stood by the window as the man went in, waiting to see what was there. Once inside, the man carelessly dumped the sack on the floor and a cry of pain came with it. Shut up, the man growled. Thinking of his own brothers and sisters now lost to Dama, uh, now lost to him, Damish ground his teeth. Uh. The man stooped and opened the sack, dragging out a little girl, still in her nightgown, no older than three years. Sit there, and if you try to run, I'll kill you. White-faced, the child obeyed while the man opened a closet door and let out two other children, a boy and another girl, their tear-streaked faces as grubby as their nightclothes. Then the man dragged them over to the table and threw a loaf of bread on it. The bread made a thump and cracked in pieces, hard and dry. The two children from the closet grabbed hungrily for the bread, but the new stolen girl began to cry. I told you to sh shut up, the man roared, and he cuffed her. His hand was raised for another blow, but there was a sudden crash from the window. He spun toward the sound and saw an animal, a man, hurtling through the window, splinters of wood flying around it. In an instant, his wrist was caught in an iron grip. He looked up into dark, blazing eyes in the softly bearded face of a youth, and a mouth snarling like a wolf's, with a wolf's white skin and gleaming teeth. How dare you strike an innocent, Damish roared, flinging the man against the wall. But this was no weak man to be cowed by a pale, slim youth. As soon as he, sees, as soon as he saw Damish had no weapon, the man leaped up, a knife gleaming in his hand, and he stabbed Damish in the belly. There was a moment of silence, broken only by the stifled sobs of the little girl. The kidnapper leered into Damish's face, his breath rank. 
You, he said. Domish reached out and took the man's knife hand, looking always into the man's eyes, and pushed it away from him, drawing the knife out. The man looked down, then back up with widening eyes as he realized that Domish was not bleeding. With a flick of his fingers, Domish snapped the man's wrists. Even the kidnapper's lips were white as he backed away. With a look of understanding came, uh, then a look of understanding came into his face, and he fumbled in his shirt with his good hands, bringing out a crucifix on a chain. Damish murmured, frowning, "How often that sign has been used to destroy, though your priests say it stands for life." The kidnapper shook the crucifix, babbling in Latin. Damish laughed, and that laugh was terrible and beautiful to hear. You foolish man, if I cannot stay me, I am God's messenger of justice. I saw, no, I saw no mark of lamb blood upon your door, so to me you are not redeemed. Now you shall be the victim you have tried to make of these innocents. He stepped forward. The man turned to run, and Damish took him by the shirt collar, lifting him as easily as a cat does a kitten. Then Damish turned to the children, who were clutching each other and watching with wide eyes and open mouths. Come, children, said Damish, in as gentle a voice as he could manage. Do not be afraid. I have come to release you, to bring you home to your mothers. Take my other hand. He held it out to them, and they flinched away. Then the newest little girl, perhaps not yet numbed with fear and despair, stepped timidly forward and put her tiny hand into Damish's great one. Will you take the hand of this little girl then? Damish asked the other two, and they did that. Through the streets they went, Damish's voice echoing from the house fronts, like the shofar, calling the people out of their depression, a son of sound piercing the darkness. Come out, come out and see the real thief of your children, come out and hear the voice of truth, the voice of justice. Come out, feel the wind of the Lord moving through your streets, breathing life into desolation, come out. By the time they reached the magistrate's steps, there was a great crowd with them. In the torchlight, with the villain in one hand and the children in the other, his face young and darkly beautiful, Damish seemed indeed like an avenging angel. The magistrate's door opened just as the bereaved parents came plunging through the crowd, even as the kidnapper was shouting, He is Nosferatu! Destroy him! He lies! Damish whispered to the children, Be not afraid. Tell the truth and all will be well. He can no longer hurt you. By the time the magistrate looked to see who had brought the criminal to justice, the avenging angel had vanished. It had been a hundred years since the emperor's decree that anyone who accused the Jews, the Jews of ritual sacrifice should be put to death, and that emperor had died in the meantime. So the kidnapper, Martin Beck, was merely imprisoned, though there was some idea that he should be put in a madhouse with his talk of vampires. And in the ghetto, life continued as usual. As Martin Beck, imprisoned though he was, had two things. Powerful friends and time to think. By the time his powerful friends had contrived to get him free, Beck had quite thoroughly planned his revenge. He might be discredited, and nobody would listen to his talk of vampires, but he still had men, servants of his family, who would follow him on any campaign, and he knew still other men who would jump at any excuse to make life a misery for the Jews, just as Beck himself had been trying to do all along. He had failed once, that night when he had been attacked in the ghetto. He had failed again, this time. And both times, he knew now he failed because of the vampire boy. He would not fail again. Leading his men, Beck could turn the ghetto inside out. Eventually, he would find a boy asleep who would not wake. He knew it with all his heart, and that boy, impervious to the crucifix though he might be, still had a head and a body from which to cut it, and I will do that with this hand, he swore aloud, shaking the one Damish had broken. It had plenty of time to heal. The very day he was released, Beck gathered his men and strode into the ghetto. He knew nobody would stop him. The Jews had no power to stop a Christian from whatever he might intend, and most of the Christians cared little for the welfare of Jews. Uh, go, he snapped his fingers, and the men scattered like seeds of anger. He smiled as he heard shouts from the houses of a crash of broken crockery here and there, the shrieks of women. A man came out of one house with a silver cup in his hand. Confiscated it, did you? Beck called. The man grinned, showing broken teeth. It was all justice to them. Nothing, Beck, his steward reported after a while. 
and we have turned out every house in the ghetto. Of course, Speck said, slapping his thigh. There is only one place these blasphemers could ke be keeping their pet vampire in their so-called holy place. He led his men up the synagogue steps, but before he could put his hand to the door, it opened, and a white-bearded patriarch stood in the frame. And what might the Christian gentleman desire of poor Jews so late in the afternoon, he asked mildly. Out of my way, old man, Beck growled. We are here to do you a favor by ridding you of a troublesome evil. Evil? The rabbi looked surprised. Evil? No evil plagues us, sir, I assure you. Beck's lip curled. No, I do not suppose it would plague you, infidel Jew, since you are already the most evil race on the earth. The rabbi did not even blink. Surely then, sh uh, sir, you would be better off removing your sanctity from such sinful company. Company, not so? Pick of a Jew, how dare you mock me? Beck raised his hand to strike the old man. A low, angry murmur stopped him. He looked around and saw that he and his men were surrounded by all the men of the ghetto, far more men than he had expected. I think, perhaps, said the rabbi quietly, that it might be wise for you to go. Even so long af after the kind emperor's decree, there are still Christians who would have little sympathy for one who bore false witness against Jews and was perhaps less than kindly removed from a Jewish quarter. Beck lowered his hand. For today you have won, but only for today, he growled. Then he turned on his heel and left. The men of the ghetto followed him to the gate and made sure he was gone. Then they rushed back to the synagogue, all talking at once. Simcha hushed them. We must wait, he said, until tonight. We cannot make decisions for Damash until he is awake to hear them. Damn, this book just keeps, keeps going. I feel like this story has had like three endings already. That night, the whole community, men, women, young people, rabbi, damish, and all, gathered in the synagogue to try and decide what to do. If I run from here, Beck on will only vent his anger on the rest of you. He must find me, damish said. But if he finds you, then how if he takes you to the Christians? asked Yitzhak, the printer. How much, how much the worse for all of us when it is known there are vampires among us? One vampire, Nathan said, does not make a community of vampires necessarily. And how shall they think when they find we have sheltered an evil being among us, said another man, looking somewhat shamefacedly at Damish. He is not an evil being, said Rabbi Simcha. He is our brother. Shall we heap error upon the error made against him when he was turned out from his home? No, he has a home here now. And he has kept us in our homes, saving us from the lies told against us by risking his own safety. We owe him our lives. We cannot ask him to give up his such as it is. I, uh, as I see it, said one of the young Talmudic students. The problem here is how to keep our brother awake during the day. If Beck is seeking one among us who sleeps as though dead while the sun shines, then we must make sure that such a one cannot be found among us. When he sees our brother awake under the sun, he cannot think our brother a vampire. There were murmurs of assent, nodding of heads, stroking of beards. Excuse me, said Naomi, a bright girl and as avid a scholar as she was allowed to be. Our brother is our shamus, or our shamash. Is not the name of the sun also shamash? If our brother is the sun, then how shall the sun hurt him? The rest of them silenced her, saying, There is no time for wordplay, and continued their argument. But Damish caught her eye, nodded, and smiled. He had an idea, and, he to and when he told them, they could not argue with it. The next day, Beck returned with more men, and again the ghetto was turned inside out. After all, what if the Jews had moved their vampire out of the synagogue? Best to make sure, Beck called to his men. But in the end, the mob mounted the synagogue steps as they had the day before, and this time the rabbi stepped aside and let them shuffle in. There was one man there, wrapped in his prayer shawl, uh, praying in a quiet musical chanting. Even Beck moved a little respectfully, infected by the sanctity of the place. They did not turn the benches over, but only looked under them. The rabbi opened every door for them, and each man uh, looked in every corner. 
Beck was beginning to be angry. There must be a hiding place somewhere. There must. The singing of the one man at prayer was getting on his nerves. He stamped up to him and said, Be still a moment and let a man hear himself think, why don't you? The man turned to him and Beck's heart nearly stopped as he looked into the dark eyes of the boy who had broken his wrist. It is in music that we can still... Uh, but it is in music that we can still our own thoughts and hear the voice of God, uh, Martin Beck, Damish said. Even you must understand that. You have spent so much time listening to the voice of your own anger. But, but, Beck stuttered, the sun was shining on his enemy through the bright colored windows and what he had thought a vampire was only a young man with blessing and inspiration in his face. Damish turned away from him, speaking to the air, to the Torah scrolled in its ark, to all who were, stilled, uh, who were stilled and listening. The light of God's presence is like a hundred suns, but the sweet presence of God is the nurturing dark of the womb. Blessed is the darkness in which creation is formed, and blessed is the light which is life to all creation. Shall not the one in prayer be lifted up to God, who is all light and all darkness? Shall not the sound of prayer clothe the one in divinity and make him one with God? And how shall he who is one with God hear darkness or light, force or sadness, pain or death? For he who is one with God is beyond death, as God is beyond death, and he shall live in the Lord's light forever and ever. Amen, murmured one of Beck's men. Beck wanted to turn and glare at him, but found himself immobilized. Look at me, Damish said to him. You are not entirely a bad man. You could not make yourself kill children. Look at me and understand. And Beck looked into the eyes of darkness and found himself drawn through darkness into light. Shadow, giver of form, is no evil in itself. Only man's fear and ignorance make it so. Beck understood and cast his eyes down, leaving the ghetto with his men, a wiser and more thoughtful man. Then Damish lifted up his voice, and all the people sang with him a song of praise and peace from the time of atonement. Our Father, our King, be gracious unto us and answer us, for we have no good words of our own. Deal with us in charity and kindness and save us. And after a little while, some people noticed that Damish was not singing, but had sat down with his eyes closed, and there was great joy and peace in his face. He has gone to sleep, whispered the, uh, one, and they nodded and picked him up gently and carried him to his bed. He did not wake that night, nor the next, nor the third, and the third night, Naomi said, he held the sun inside him and he has died, but his flesh did not decay, so they could not know if he was truly dead or not. So they took him, as they had heard the golem of Prague was taken, was taken and put him in the room with the old Torah scrolls wrapped in the prayer shawl he had worn on his last day under the sun. The Nazis burned that synagogue during the war, but somebody saw a young man wearing a great old-style prayer shawl striding through the flames. The Torah scroll cradled in his arms like a child, and the flames seemed to shy away from him. When the soldiers tried to stop him, their bullets made no difference to him, and they fell on their knees, weeping when they looked into his eyes. Nobody knew who he was, and nobody saw which way he went, but everyone remembered a fragment of the story, and that is what I have told you this night. What the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck? What the fuck was that? Blood Libel by Lee Ann Hussey. I feel like I was just indoctrinated into the Jewish religion. <laughs> okay. Thoughts. That did not at all go anywhere I was expecting it to. And for the last sentence, the last paragraph to be, and then the Nazis burned down that synagogue would just took me out for a second. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like, um, well, I don't know what I was going to say, actually. <laughs> I generally like, uh, religious style stories kind of like that because I like the peace that people can find in the religion. It's really lovely when people genuinely mean that, like, we need to love each other and take care of each other, but I'm not particularly religious. I'm not, I mean, I should say, I'm not religious at all. I'm a, I'm a dirty atheist, so, um, 
it's fun to read about but it's also not any oh my god my candle burned down so far um it's not like anything i take like true meaning out of you know it's just like a fun little story but it is uh, very wild how that had like three different endings and none of them were what i was expecting (laughs) what a story and it ended up taking a whole freaking hour to read it was a lot longer than i expected okay saying that my sad little candle okay (laughs) i'm tired okay um yeah thanks for being here thanks for listening to the stories and thank you if you made it all the way to the end i really 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 appreciate it i know that some of the stories can be rough and it's very easy to click off and do something else so thank you for being here i like to do these readings uh, once a week sundays eastern standard time six o'clock um even if it's sunny out now and the vibes are kind of weird starting in the light instead of the dark i'm gonna keep doing it at six and um i will i might see you next week i might not i'm working on a video um that my personal deadline is on the 15th and i don't think i'm gonna hit it and if i want it to be coming out close to the 15th i really need to grind down and i probably won't have energy to do a reading next week but i might anyway i don't really know um i'll try to put a little post up a scheduled post up so like if you're looking out for it you look out for it and if it's gonna happen it's gonna happen if not hey i'll have that uh, other book video out soon soon i swear i'm so tired of it i want to be done and i want to post it (laughs) okay yeah see you guys next week maybe see you around definitely (laughs) good night (laughs) goodbye